Awesome. Very good. Thank you, Nancy. So welcome. And if you are new, we have been going through the book Known. It is part of our conversation series which really is just what it says it is. It's a chance to start the conversation on some important topics that all of us deal with at some point in our lives. And um, we've been loving it. We have been challenged by one another. We have been encouraged by one another. And uh, this, this concept of being known, I think I shared even before we did this book, that um, being known like it breaks my heart when I see people who don't feel seen, um, who don't feel known. That really breaks my heart. And uh, we can be known not only by one another, but by the God of the universe. And that's what we're talking about. So we are on conversation three. It starts on page 29 and there's a couple of questions. And um, so I wanted to start by telling you a story story um, about me, personal story, that kind of talks to this uh, topic of working to earn it. That's the title of this chapter. So when I was younger, much younger than I am now, uh, I played flute. And if you are friends with me on Facebook, you saw that I, yeah, I posted something about practicing my flute the other day. I kind of felt like getting it out and, and playing around. So I played flute and I was very serious about it. Um, I come from a long line of musicians on my father's side, especially. And so when there was an inkling that there was a talent, then it was all in. And I was all in with the flute, uh, private lessons, the best instrument that my family could afford, um, camps, everything. And eventually I wound up at Interlochen. Any of you in the North may be familiar. <laughs> <laughs> Julie, your face. I wound up. Okay, we'll talk. We'll talk. Um, I wound up at Interlochen, which is in the UP of Michigan. Um, a beautiful, beautiful place. And I was not only a camper there, which is what it's most well known for, but I went to the academy and studied flute even more seriously if that was possible. And my whole goal <laughs> was to be the best flutist, flautist, whatever you want to say that uh, I could possibly be. I dreamt of the New York Philharmonic. I was, and like I said, I was all in. And it was an extremely intense year, made some beautiful music, wonderful memories, incredible people. I don't regret it again a bit, but as I was nearing the end of my senior year there, I realized something extremely important and that was I could not spend the rest of my life in a practice room that I uh, had been chasing a dream that I thought was my dream and it turns out that it actually wasn't uh, it turns out that because I was really good at something and I got a lot of attention because of it uh, that I thought it was supposed to be what I would do for the rest of my life. And it just became so clear to me that even though I could do it and do it well, that doesn't mean I was supposed to be doing it forever. Um, I came home on Christmas break. I'm pretty sure it was Christmas break and uh, told my dad. And he didn't speak to me for a week. That's okay. That's all right. I, it, was t it was a tough week. It was a tough week, but I have never, ever regretted that decision. Not once. Not once have I regretted it because I knew, um, even though I had no idea what I was going to do next, like uh, this, this is what I'd been chasing for years. My whole life was revolving around this one thing. Um, I just knew that I could not do that. And uh, so began the, the journey forward in figuring out exactly who I was. So as I was looking through this chapter and reading the verses and the, the story that's in the beginning of it, it's very much about expectations and about why do we chase the things that we do? And what is it or is there something we're trying to chase in that thing approval love recognition um 
you know, for me, I was known as a flute player and a really good one. And that my whole identity was wrapped up in that. And uh, breaking free of it was incredibly scary, but it had to be done. And it wasn't who I was supposed to be. And I actually had never stopped to ask God, <laughs> what should I be doing with the rest of my life? Is this really the thing that I should be chasing? And so that's kind of what I thought we could talk about this week are these, these ways in which we try to be known through this kind of striving, this kind of striving in ways that we can do for years. I mean, I was on the cusp of being 18 years old uh, when I realized this. I'd been playing flute since, gosh, fourth, fifth grade, whenever it is they start you out on an instrument. Um, and, it, you know, it can come to you like a lightning bolt, like it did for me, or it can come in a, in a slow, uh, steady, unsettled feeling that you are not um, properly going after the thing that you should be going after. Uh, but it can hit each of us differently. And the uh, Bible verses that are in chapter three are from Philippians, and some of them are my life verses, which I think is just so very interesting. And uh, it's Paul, part of it is Paul talking about, um, you know, how he had strived and strived to be this perfect Jew. And he had it wired. I mean, he kept every rule. He was well known for it. And he chased, and he strived, and he went after this. And it led someplace terribly sad, which was the persecution and death of Christians in the early church. And so that, that, those are the things I'd like for us to discuss this week. And I just love to hear what you guys have to say about that, if you want to share at all, too. Um, again, if you are new to joining us, then um, if you are on the phone, it's star six to unmute and remute. And then, of course, for those of you who are on video, you can, um, your box is either in the upper right hand corner or the lower left hand for uh, unmuting yourself if you have video as well. So um, these are the questions that I want us to uh, look at. And I'm, I'm on page 34 now. Um, and it's kind of a combination of these first couple of questions. Like, what are some things, and this is what really got me thinking, what are some things in your life that you're proud of? What is one thing you'd like people to see or recognize about you. And this can be a good positive thing. It doesn't have to be like my dramatic story of, of realizing I was not to be a professional flautist. Um, but there are ways in which we chase um, that are not healthy. And then I love this question about Paul, uh, where it says, what do you think it felt like for Paul to go through this radical shift of loyalty in his life? You see, he was a, pers a persecutor of Christians and then he became, um, Jesus met him personally. Wonderful story uh, that you should find in the book of Acts. And um, then he became one of the greatest apostles and the writer of so many of the, the books of the New Testament. So I would love to hear from you on any of the things that I have said so far, um, either about the striving or about wrapping yourself up in an identity. Um, yeah. Go for it. So um, I'm very good at math. Um, I have a master's in it. I have, I, you know, I've got 30 hours beyond a master's in it. I was working on my PhD and it took um, doing, I was, did the oral qualifying exam. I had to pass that and then I could write my dissertation and I'd be Dr. Ann, and I failed the orals. And that was, um, oh, yay, Julie, I'm glad there's another math geek in the room. <laughs> <laughs> um, that was such a huge blessing because that's when I realized that 
I didn't like graduate school. I loved the learning about math, but I liked the teaching that I got to do as a graduate assistant. And I was only trying to get that PhD because everybody in my life expected me to. So I left without it, which, I mean, I got a lot of pushback from the university department because, you know, they give me a lot of money to study there working on it. And it's like, well, you failed. Lots of people fail the first time. And it's true. But it was a it was such a blessing because that's what got me to Cheyenne where I am now. That's where I really found out that I love teaching and, and um, I've since learned that I actually have a gift of what I would call a gift of teaching. Um, and I think that what I, you know, it was, I can relate to Paul too, because that was for me a, a radical shift. I was an itty bitty baby Christian then. Um, so oh. that was another reason it was good that got me, got, got me out of there um, to a place where I could actually meet people who really loved his word and I could start growing on there. But that was like a complete change of direction for my entire life, just like you said, Kara. So I can relate so much to that story. Oh, that's very familiar. Yes. Yeah. Kara, like you, I was very much interested in the arts. Now, my family heritage is grandparents on vaudeville. Uh, my mother, before she immigrated here to the U.S., she was offered a permanent cast position in a very prestigious touring theatrical company. So it's in my blood. Wow. Yeah. My goal was I was going to go out to LA and make it big. How many times have we heard that? Well, I never got there. My college days were meandering. And I finally, I ended up a college dropout and I worked whatever job I could get. I was a secretary in a public relations office. I was a bookkeeper. I did desktop publishing when it was brand new. I even taught a couple of courses at college level <laughs> on graphic design. And I'm thinking to myself, what am I doing with my life? I got all of this meandering path, but God knew I needed to go on that path because Stonecroft came into my area. I mean, I had been, uh, long family history with Stonecroft as well. I sang my first solo at a Stonecroft brunch when I was 13. Well, they started a new group in my area. They needed somebody who could handle the finances while well, I was a bookkeeper. Then they needed someone to help with the invitations. Well, I knew graphic design. Would somebody take notes at our meeting, please? Well, I had spent years taking minutes at board of directors meetings where I worked. So God knew all the skills I was going to need for Stonecroft. And he put me in those places to get me where I am. And little bonus, now I'm beginning a professional career as a voiceover artist. So I don't have to be in LA to be an actress. <laughs> that is so fun. I love it. I love hearing your family's history. And yes, I love how he orchestrates all the things, all of it, right? The good, the bad, the ugly, the gorgeous. He orchestrates all of it to give us a new identity from him, right? And, it's of, like when you have a, a needle point or a cross stitch. If you're looking at the back side, all you got is the tangles and the knots but God is looking at the front side. He knows where all those threads are woven. Oh, I love that example. I love it. Thank you, Sharon, for sharing that. And you'll have to tell us what kind of voiceover work you do so we can go and listen to it. <laughs> that may be fun. I'll link you to my website. <laughs> good, good, please do. <laughs> well, I, I have a story. Of course, you know I always you know I always have a story anyway, right? <laughs> <laughs> My life is full of stories. Uh, but I as I listen to everyone, I'm like, 
Oh, I, I just wish you guys had been with me earlier in my life so you could have pointed me in the right direction earlier. Why didn't you guys do that? <clears throat> but I, uh, <laughs> I didn't know anything about what I wanted to do, what direction I wanted to go in. So the only thing I knew, job, work, get one promotion, another, and another. That's the way you're supposed to do things. You know, I'm just don't know anything so i'm just that's what you're supposed to do and and i and everybody just always said how great i was doing what a great job i was doing it you know how families are right they're excited when you you know they can brag about you and uh as a as a single woman i bought my first house when i was 25 years old so you know what to say oh but there was something that i didn't understand I, I just kept going in life doing this and you know I lived in Texas for a couple years and then I came back home and you know life kept going on and but I was something that was missing and I didn't know what it was something was I kept searching and searching and and I asked questions but nobody seemed to have any really good answers so I just kept asking and I'm going to end this with one uh I first really started feeling that I had some inkling when I started Bible study. Now, I was a Christian already, but I was one of those Christians who went to church on Sundays, ladies, but I wasn't studying. And um, that first day of Bible study, it was just like my eyes, my eyes got this big because I'm just like, wow, this is so cool. I'm excited. And from that day in 1983, I still feel the same way about Bible study. But I still, and every time you read something, somebody say, what's your purpose? <clears throat> How do I know what my purpose is? So I spent most of my life looking for my purpose, believe it or not. And I, even though was, I finally realized I was already doing my purpose, but I did, I was, I was thinking it was some mysterious thing over there, something that, oh, that other people had and figured out and I could never figure it out. I didn't know, I wasn't that, you know, bright, and I couldn't put the pieces together. And uh, it was just, just, I spent so much time just, and then everything I accomplished, if I went on six cruises, if I went to Italy, if I um, saved my money, I was always diligent. So all of these things, things, I thought those were just what you were supposed to do, which there's nothing wrong with them. I don't mean there's anything wrong with them. Every time I would accomplish something, I still didn't feel fulfilled. There was some emptiness. And, and I always would try to uh, engage people in dialogue, but some people say, oh, you, you just go, you know, we don't want to, uh, we don't understand what you're talking about, you know, because I kept saying, what is it? What is it? What is it? What is it? Help me. Tell me what you think. What have you been through? So I'm just letting you know that I've just kind of to just kept searching because I, it was something missing until I realized it was just, I was only totally satisfied when I was doing what Christ wanted me to do. And that may not be the buying the house or going on expensive vacations. And I had to become good with that. You know what I mean? Become good with, uh, I have some ministries that are close to my heart and it's always been children, the brokenhearted and the outcasts. Since I was a child, see, so as a child, it was already there, but I didn't have anybody that guided me. That's another story. And so I had to figure it out. I'm the same person that God made me to be, but life drifted me around to come to the person that he had cre created me to be originally, because he always had a plan. And I, I just took so long to uh, see it with my human eyes and embrace it in my heart. And, and, and now I, I am so focused, I said, hey, look, I know what I'm doing and most of my life has already gone and the rest of it is going to be actually focused, focus, focus only on the things that have meaning in my life. And I know when it has meaning because I, the Holy Spirit just, it's, it's, it's just like I'm surrounded by the goodness and, and the grace and the mercy and the peace of Jesus Christ. And so um, I, I'm not going to talk anymore, but um, <laughs> I wondered a lot. <laughs> 
That is so good, Shirley. Yeah, it is um, amazing the number of books or memes or little quotes or whatever's where it's like, you know, the dream the life you want or go after that thing you think, you know, like, and you're like, yeah, I should do that. Wait, what is it? You know, and you're like, you're spending all of this time and energy searching it out and trying to find the answers and asking everyone you know, right? I get it. I get it. But you're right. There, there is a place and a person to rest in and to find our purpose in. So good. I want to hear from others. I feel like I'm missing like this whole conversation in the chat box. But does anybody else want to speak to this topic? Can I jump in? I'm Sherry from British Columbia. Jump right in. We're so glad and you're I here. Hope you don't, I hope there's no picture of me because I haven't even combed my hair yet. <laughs> there is not a picture of you, but we think you're pretty anyway. Go ahead. I was, I was ironing away and I realized it was time to be online. And I just caught the end of Sharon's comments about Stonecroft uh, changing her life and getting into Bible study, singing her first solo at age 10. That's, Stonecraft changed my life after I had my first child. And that's when I came back to my music and began singing it. We called it Christian Women's Club. And that's where I, that's where my life was changed. But the one thing I want to say is talking about who we are or the aloneness inside. It's the aloneness that I had to deal with. And Pascal's quote, there's a heart, a God-shaped vacuum in the heart of every man that just changed my whole life because God filled that void. I grew up as a Christian, but I fell away in university and et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, I just want to share that there's a God-shaped vacuum in the heart of each one of us, and that's how we're created, and that's how he uses us and places us where he wants us to be. Thanks for listening. Absolutely. Thank you for stopping your ironing and coming to share with us. Yes, I love that quote. Very much so. And I, I, I think we all definitely feel it. You know, we can feel that it, that emptiness creates the striving because we're trying to fill it with other stuff. Um, who else? Well, let's talk about, uh, and feel free to jump in, but let's talk about Paul just a little bit more and um, focus in on him. Of course, his, um, his story is quite dramatic uh, to go from being someone who made sure that Christians were arrested and probably tortured and uh, killed to having someone um, who gave up everything in order to see the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, go forward in the world. Um, so I want to, I'm on page 32 of our books, and I just want to read a little bit of these verses. Because again, these, these are some of my life verses. They're, it's how, what I honestly do in a good way, strive toward, um, it's toward the bottom. And he, he's been talking about, he was a, a Jew among Jews. I once thought these things were valuable but now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. Yes, everything else is worthless compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage so that it could gain Christ and be one with him. So I'd love to know your guys' thoughts. Like, what does that stir up in you? Um, they never cease to make me go, oh, I want that to be me, you know? Anyone want to jump in? Well, I'll go back to what I said before about the acting. It wasn't until I felt that that part of my life was of no value and, and worthless anymore that God gave it back to me. Ah. Oh. Oh, that's huge. Can we just sit on that for a minute? Anybody else experience that in their life where God asks you to take, 
to, he's going to take something away because you need to rediscover your true identity, your true value, and he gives it back again. Well, I had a similar, it wasn't really that into that degree, but after Jenny died and Danny died, it was a point of, after two years, the Lord was asking us to adopt. Well, we had a three bedroom house. And Jenny's room, we had turned into my Bible study room and office. And we knew we were going to adopt siblings, which meant I would have had to change the room. And I'm like, mm, Lord, I really do not want to change this room. So I had talked to Tim about turning our garage into my bedroom. So then I could still keep my office and Jenny's room, the way it was decorated because God had decorated it. So one night, two o'clock in the morning, Holy Spirit gets me up, sends me to the office, down on my hands and knees, reading Deuteronomy 26 about children. And I broke and I cried and I said, fine. If you want to put a live child in this room, I give you this room. Do with it as you may. That that morning, well, the next morning, I had to go in and teach a Bible study lesson. And when Tim was on vacation, when I got home, he looked at me and he says, you are so spoiled. And I said, yes, I know. Thank you. Why? <laughs> and he says, no, seriously, you are just so spoiled. And I said, okay, thank you. Why? And he says, I have to talk to you. And I'm like, oh, what did I do? And he calls him, I had a Maryism day. And I said, okay. He says, I had to walk around the house three times. I went, okay, this is getting interesting. And he says, I got to Jenny's bedroom window. And I went, really? He says, yeah, third time around. I went, oh, really? And he said, yeah, you are so spoiled. And I said, I know. Thank you. Why? And he says, um, you get your garage. And I said, excuse me? He says, Jenny's room stays Jenny's room. You get your garage. And I went, seriously? He says, oh, very loud and clear. He says, you get the garage. And he says, God will put the children in the other rooms. And he says, the office stays the office and the prayer room. And I went, hey, hallelujah. So God allowed me to keep the room because that room was dedicated to God. But it was once I surrendered it as Jenny's room to your will be done in that room, whatever your will is. He allowed me to have my heart's desire. And that is one of the things that just amazes me about God is that when we are willing to surrender, he's willing to bless. And it, it, I, that story just gets me every time because it's like, yep, it all happened in that day period of 2 a.m. until two o'clock in the afternoon and it all flipped. <laughs> like, well, only God, only God. Wow, Mary, thank you for sharing. Um, what is part of a really hard story for you, but it's so true there. And I'm sure there are other stories here and I'd love to hear them if, if anybody wants to share or where God asks, he says, either not now, not at all. I need to take this away. Can you trust me with this? And he holds it securely uh, in his hands. And then later, as this beautiful surprise, mm -hmm. gives it back to us. Yeah. Anybody else experience that? I, I to wanted to, to share it with you. Oh, okay. go ahead, whoever that was. <laughs> I, w I was just going to say that uh, I, as a person, I'd already told you that I am. I just, I just I have to always be achieving something because... Uh, I get bored very easy. So it's how to create, how to make it better, how to read up on technology, blah, blah, blah. And I was always pretty diligent with money. And the 2008 
crisis in this country. The real estate uh, it devastated all the finances that I have worked so hard to save. And I had a little struggle with this, ladies, because it takes a long time to save that kind of money, but it doesn't take as long for it to eventually <laughs> go away, okay? And <laughs> I had to really trust God in a way financially, because I, I, I was, and I'm gonna use this word, I, I was proud of how diligent I was with my finances and how much I had accomplished. And, um, and I had to really just depend on him just by faith that, but he never left me nor forsaken me. I never went hungry or didn't have a place to stay. So that, you know, I want to say that, but every now and then Satan will try to remind me, well, you know, you used to have, and I said, but I am so content. I am so in love with what God is doing in my life and how he's just loved me through all those years. And I, so I'm saying in a way, it's like that money being gone was another opportunity for me to draw closer to Jesus Christ. Oh, Shirley, thank you. Yes, um, often, don't you find that when he takes something away that is a source of pride or a source of um, identity that uh, he will bless later, for sure. I love that. Bonnie, I think you were gonna say something. Well, I was just gonna say, my husband and I, as we were very active in our church at one time, our, our son became 13 and he became the quintessential teenager, very, very rebellious. And it, that continued until after he moved out of the home, we actually became estranged uh, for 14 years. And in 14 years, we only saw him twice. And the heart of a mother, even now, my heart breaks by thinking about it. But again, when I put him back on the altar and said, God, he's yours, you control him. You control his life. You deal with him. I can't deal with him. I can't be the Holy Spirit in his life and I'll give him back to you. When I did, God restored that relationship. And I mean, he was just here yesterday and, and the relationship's definitely been, it's been restored for a long time now. Um, if you ladies would pray with us, he's not serving the Lord. Um, he made a commitment to the Lord many, many years ago, but he's not in church. I think he was hurt at one point by the church and maybe a little jealous, jealous of his mom and dad's um, time that we spent in church. And as a result, he's kind of rebelled against being in church. But um, he calls us and asks us for prayer and asks us to pray for friends of his. And so he knows, you know, but um, that would be a prayer request that I would share with you ladies, because I know you will pray. Um, but, you know, just again, knowing that we have to give those things to the Lord and trust him that in his timing, it will happen and that we need to be willing to be the instrument that God wants us to be, to bring it to pass as well. Uh -huh. Yeah, I, I like that thought there. And yes, we will pray. Um, and if you want to share, we would love to know his first name so that we can pray for him. His name is David. David. <laughs> Beloved. <laughs> Beloved by God. A man after God's own heart. All right, David, we'll be praying for him. Um, oh, man, nothing, nothing gets to you like your kids, right? Um, but I, I like where you said you, you gave it up, you put it back on the altar. I always love that imagery, um, putting something into God's hands and saying, you need to do, God, what you're going to do with this. Um, but at the end, you said, and then be willing to be the instrument he wants you to be. And I have found that where I think, um, you know, I'm supposed to use some talent or gift or whatever it is. I have an idea of how it's supposed to be used. And then I realized that I was completely wrong. Um, imagine that. And then God comes back and says, okay, now it's time. And this is 
actually how I'd like for you to use this gift. That has definitely happened in my life with the music thing that it, it did come back around, by the way. <laughs> but um, yes, I really like that. Bonnie, thank you for sharing your heart. Yes. About your son. Thank you, Bonnie. So, um, so I don't have, well, it was big to me. It's different there. I don't have kids, so I don't have kids stories, but um, I'm a child of the 60s, women's liberation and all of that junk that totally messed up generations of women. Um, so I was proud to be independent, that I could take care of myself, but I didn't buy my first house as young as Shirley, but I bought mine, I paid it off, um, I took care of myself, um, and then I was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis and it was a struggle. Um, the fear came from not being able to take care of myself and from needing to rely on others. And um, when God finally made me realize that, you know, it was pride that was making me try to do things I couldn't anymore instead of asking for asking for help from people who are so willing and wanted to help me that um, that God blessed me with this incredible church family who um, take care of me. I had to move from my house to another one that was all on one level and so many people from the church and friends of people from my church showed up that from the time they got at my old house and loaded everything in the trailers and trucks and had everything unboxed and the bed set up at my new house was less than two hours. And I wouldn't, I know it's, it's overwhelming. And, and I can, the way God uses it for me is, you know, I, I can use that story to help other women mostly, um, but other people to say, hey, you know, God didn't intend for us to go it alone. And, and it's a blessing to ask for and accept help from others. And it also helped with... Um, you know, it was like the last of my control freak tendencies that God is like, okay, you're done with that. That may, woke me up to all these other things in my life where controlling and being perfect was what I thought I needed to do to stay loved by God um, and loved by people who knew me. If they knew how yucky I can be inside, no one was going to love me anymore if they really knew me. So... <sighs> So even a physical disability is a gift from God. Absolutely. And thank you for sharing that. Oh, man. Accepting help and um, letting go of an independent spirit is super hard. Super hard. Um, so God bless you for... <laughs> He let him, him like, you let him take you through that journey and and we do pray that your health is is um keeping up okay we're good i'm doing well praise good, god good so. good my best friend has ms she was just diagnosed about six months ago if and, she needs uh, someone to talk to kara if she needs someone to talk to honestly oh. feel free to give her my information oh thank you and i will do that it, it is a very mystifying and strange disease, and there's it a is. lot to uh, navigate there for sure. Thank you. Yes, sure. Okay. All right. Anybody else um, want to share or any other thoughts on this idea of um, striving and rooting your identity in one thing and, and God shaking you loose from that into something else? Anybody else want to share?
All righty. Well, um, I, I too, as someone, I think it might have been you, Anne, where you said you relate to Paul, and I definitely have always related to Paul in his his striving for this being a Jew among Jews and for having perfection in this area of his life. And, you know, it's extremely easy, I think, at least for me, it has been <clears throat> to put my identity in what I do. And uh, in my work, uh, even in volunteer positions, whatever it is, uh, I tend to do that. That is a struggle for me instead of putting my identity in Jesus Christ. And he longs for us to, um, sorry, I was checking the chat box here. Uh, he longs for us to discover that identity. And it, it's a life, I'm finding, um, it's a lifelong thing. It's a continual coming back to him and his word and being still and being willing to uh, chomp through those hard shells that we tend to put up around ourselves. Um, Whitney, I could kind of tell you were somewhere loud. And if you are drinking a milkshake, we need to talk because it looked like it may have, oh my gosh, it was a milkshake. Ah. Oh. Um, she says, it's loud here, but I would say I had my identity rooted as a pastor's wife and God had our family change directions and it took a lot of counseling, a lot of wisdom from others and a lot of conversations with God, but we are thriving in our new season. Um, yeah, and, and I'm, I'm just willing to bet, Whitney, that you didn't even realize your identity was wrapped up in that. It, yeah, it kind of happens. Uh, without us knowing and then we start to feel those pain points because things change or we realize we can't stay in an identity anymore like I did with uh, music and then God starts to go let me show you who you really are which is a daughter of mine daughter of mine yeah oh I love it um Oh, yeah, and I like we say, we hang on too long to things that we've been doing for God. Oh, I like this, that we've been doing for God when he asks us to move in a new direction. And how about, how about to just stop doing and start being with him? I think that is often his message to me. That brings us back to Mary and Martha, doesn't it? All right. Well, we can wrap up our time together here today unless anyone has anything else that they would love to share i would love to hear from you um as always there are some really great questions things to think through um in this book i i do want to look at page 35 there's always a small prayer at the end of each of these chapters and um this one really resonated for me and it said god i work so hard to make people know me, right? So, or to think I'm successful and to do what is right. I have fallen in that trap over and over again. It hasn't helped me to feel loved or free. It feels like I can never live up to their expectations or my own, and it's usually my own. Jesus, would you show me that you love me for who I really am and not what I can accomplish? And that is my prayer for all of us. I know that it hits me super deep um, to continue to seek my approval and my uh, center and my anchor in him and him alone. Because uh, that's where all the good stuff is found for sure. So just one more, I wanna give you one more chance before we sign off. Does anybody else want to share anything with us today? That was a good prayer, Julie, yeah. Okay, real quick before we go, Julie, you know Interlochen. Are you talking Interlochen as in Switzerland? <laughs> Michigan. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah. I thought you were talking about Switzerland. I was going, what? That's what I thought too. Oh, oh Interlochen, Switzerland. <laughs> I'll go there too. I'll go there too. <laughs>
Highly recommended. I hear it's amazing. And Nancy, doesn't your brother live in Switzerland? He does. He lives in Basel. And I've been to Interlaken. Oh, Basel, yeah. And then, yeah. It's beautiful. It is phenomenal. Um, Whitney, but, you've been there? Yeah, it's so loud in this restaurant. I went hang gliding in Switzerland. It was amazing. Like, I, I went hang gliding off a mountain in Switzerland. It was awesome. Yeah, it's really amazing that I'm alive. God must have a purpose for me, so. <laughs> <laughs> bucket list for sure hang gliding that's awesome all right well uh, Kara, Kara, yes. can we pray for Rochard and for David I think that is a wonderful idea Julie would you pray for them and, and Mary's daughter Mary's yeah. daughter I missed that one there were more Mary, Kelsey. what's her name Kelsey. Kelsey, okay. Dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you for these women. I thank you for their trust in you, their love for you. And Father, as we look back over our lives, we realize that you have walked with us step by step, even the things that we didn't understand, the, the challenges that we were faced with that didn't make sense at the time but father we after walking with you we realized that that there was a plan all along and so father i lift up kelsey and david and rochard to you lord and father you have your hand on these these people's lives so father we ask that you would do what is necessary mm -hmm. to bring them back to you I pray that you would put people and circumstances everywhere they turn. Let them run into you and let them know that you love them, that you have a plan for them and let them experience you like they never have before. And I pray for you to show them the purpose, why you place them on this earth at this time. And Father, I pray they will no longer run from your love. Your love will chase them and capture them. And so, Father, we give them to you, and we ask, God, that you do what you need to do in their lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen, amen. Amen. Always so wonderful to be with you on Mondays.